the Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. For those of you who may be uh, visiting with us today who uh, are not uh, Orthodox Christians, we, we like to celebrate Easter, Pascha on the same day with everybody else, but that doesn't happen often. <laughs> Sometimes we celebrate it a week after or two weeks after. Sometimes we celebrate it, like this year, five weeks after <laughs> the Western Easter, we celebrate the Orthodox Pascha. So we're still in the 40 days of uh, the Paschal season, and about to finish that up, we will, we, that season, we'll celebrate the Ascension Day this coming Thursday. And so, uh, we're still greeting each other with Christ is risen, and um, I'm glad that I was able to come up during this season so we could greet each other in this way and sing the Paschal Hymn together. I, I'm holding uh, in my hands a special cloth, which has been uh, presented to this new Holy Community of the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America by Metropolitan Joseph. We have, uh, we have bishops in our church and then we have archbishops, we have metropolitans, we have patriarchs, and uh, Metropolitan Joseph is our uh, chief shepherd and bishop. They're all bishops, but they have different titles because of different responsibilities. And so Metropolitan Joseph is our chief shepherd in North America. Uh, he spent many years in Los Angeles. He came in 1995 from Damascus in Syria. He was born in Damascus. And uh, living in Southern California, I got to know him quickly. So I've known him for 25, going on 26 years now. And uh, he's a very strong leader. He is a sincere man. He loves God. This is, uh, this is uh, we might say, serious business. Serious business. He takes the faith seriously. He lives a, uh, a holy life. Uh, he preaches the word of God. He is a disciplinarian when he needs to be a disciplinarian. I love him. And I believe that he loves me. And that he loves you. And so this is called an antimens or antimensian. It's never been used. We won't be able to say that after today. So it has an icon on it of Christ buried in the tomb. It looks like, if you're familiar with the epitaphios that we uh, that we process with during the Holy Week, it looks just like that. Okay, but on the bottom, it has his signature that he that he blessed this antimus. And then in the top, you can't see it, but there's a sewn there's a sewn pouch in the top. And in this top where my finger is, there is a holy relic of Saint Raphael. Halloween. All right, so we have the blessed saint, the presence of this blessed saint here to pray for this holy commun community, and together the, uh, the his troparian, his apolitikian, we ask him together the lost sheep of America. <laughs> so we ask him today, in all seriousness, together the lost sheep of North Dakota to come here and to be with us and to join us in, in the, uh, the Holy Communion and in the life uh, of the Orthodox Church. So 
the holy gifts, the bread and the wine that are presented on the altar are placed on this on the Santamensian and the holy gifts are consecrated on this cloth. And without this cloth, the priest cannot do the divine liturgy. This is, this is, you see the icon, but think of it as an, as an icon in another sense. We think of icons as the manifestation of the presence of the person depicted. Okay. Let's think of this icon of the Antimensium as the manifestation of the presence of our Metropolitan Archbishop Joseph with us and his blessing for us to celebrate the Divine Liturgy and that he's always with us and we're always praying for him. St. Ignatius of Antioch said, where the bishop is, there is the church. And where the church is, there is the bishop. And so we take, we take it with all seriousness that we are not just simply a gathering of Orthodox Christians who worship together, but that we are united to a body. We are united to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church under the spiritual direction and covering of a bishop. This is what it means to be orthodox. So we pray for him and he prays for us. Now, I want to speak for a few minutes. of both the Epistle and Gospel lessons today. The homily is about enduring tests as a pathway to healing. Enduring tests as a pathway to healing. There are many verses that we could take a look at here. We'll take a look at a number, a number of verses from this gospel lesson. But the main point that I would like to make is this, that, that the tests that God introduced into our lives are a means of healing for our souls. The tests that he introduces into our life are a means of the healing of our souls. St. Nikolai of Zicha, St. Nikolai Belomirovich, says this, The blind man who had been healed passed the first test. He showed himself to be meek and obedient when the Lord sent him with clay-smeared eyes to wash himself in the pool of Siloam. That was the test of obedience. And then he passed the second test. He showed himself to be persevering under temptation and would not betray the Lord to all of the Pharisees' lies. And this is the test of temptation. The Lord confronted him with a third and final test and the greatest test, that of true faith, when he asked him, do you believe on the Son of God? And so let's look at these tests for a moment. The first is a test of the blind man's will. He was obedient to the Lord's command and he came back seeing with his physical eyes. Sometimes we're tested in our will. Sometimes we're asked to do something that we don't want to do. You know something? We never know if we're obedient until we're required to do something that we disagree with. Think about it. The second test was the test of a man's mind. The blind man's mind. Would he believe the lies of the Pharisees? What were they saying? This 
man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? God, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. You are his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Liars and deceivers. That's who they were. What about the accusations against Paul and Silas that we heard in the, epi in the epistle lesson? What did we hear? St. Paul had healed a man. And so what's the response? These men are Jews and they're disturbing our cities. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us Romans to accept or practice. And then the crowd joined in attacking Paul and Silas. And the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave them orders to be beaten with rods. And when they inflicted many blows on them, they threw them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Having received his charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But what did they do? What did Paul and Silas do? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. They lied. The leaders of the city, they lied. Paul and Silas obeyed God. We're tested in our day by lies. Tell me if you've ever been asked one of these questions. I'll bet you've been asked all of them. How could a God of love allow suffering in the world? Jesus was a prophet, but so was Confucius, so was Socrates, so was Muhammad, so was Gandhi and others. Nobody has a corner on the truth. How about this one? Constantine created Jesus, divinity. Until the Council of Nicaea, Jesus was viewed by many as, of his followers as a mighty prophet, a great and a powerful man, but a man nevertheless, just a mortal man. And as long as there's been belief in the one true God, there's been killing in his name. Tell me about the Crusades and justify your Christianity. Both of these quotes are from the movie Da Vinci Code. Everybody goes to the movies, watches the movies. They don't even know what they're hearing and being fed through the lines. How about this one? I don't believe in organized religion because the church is corrupt. Christians are racist and bigots. So are we tested in this day? Just like the blind man was tested? Just like Paul and Silas were tested? Tested by what? Lies. The third test was the test of the man's heart. Jesus said, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered, and who is he, sir? that I may believe in him. And Jesus said to him, 
you have seen them, and it is he who speaks to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Let's be like him. Let's be like the blind man who received his sight. His spiritual, first his, first his physical eyes were open and he saw Jesus standing before him. Now his spiritual eyes are open and he sees Jesus as God and he bows down and worships Jesus as God Almighty. May our spiritual eyes be opened to see the Lord Jesus Christ as God Almighty in the flesh and bow down and worship Him. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the life of the world. And I'd like to read what St. Nikolai says about this. In this reply, He is also for us and we are his contemporaries, for he is alive and forever and ever. And today we have confirmation of his words. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As long as he is in a man's soul, he is the light of that man. As long as he is in the midst of a people, he is the light of that people. As long as he is in a school, he is the light of that school. As long as he is in a workshop, he is the light of the work and the workers. Anyone from whom he withdraws his presence, a total darkness prevails. And the human soul without him becomes hell. And people without him become a pack of famished and ravening wolves. The school without him becomes a poison factory of folly. The workshop without him becomes a place of grumbling and hatred. And think of the hospitals and the prisons without him. They have become dark taverns of despair. Indeed, whoever thinks on the days of his life, the days without Christ and days with Christ, this man has in himself a witness to the truth of the words of the Lord. As long as I am in the world, I am the light. So what might have this saying to do with our day? Is it not a rather poignant commentary on the world that we live in today? The mass shooters in our society, are they not famished and ravenous wolves? Our schools, our colleges, our universities, have they not become poison factories of folly? Our politically correct places of work, places of grumbling and hatred. St. Nikolai nailed us a hundred years ago. We're living the, the world that he described a hundred years ago when he wrote this. And so how would we apply this to our own lives today? It's incumbent upon us to respond appropriately to whatever tests are placed in our lives by God for the healing and strengthening of our soul. We must obey Him. He may allow us to be confronted by our fellow man in such a way that we're tempted to betray Him or at least hide our knowledge of the truth. Like, I don't want anybody to know I'm a Christian. We must confess Him and proclaim Him as God. He may seek and find us who have become outcasts in our family, at our school, at our job, even in our church or in our public life. And we must believe in Him and confess.
continuously worship Him. He is seeking us out. If we have been cast out, He will seek us out. And we will bow down and worship Him. Because God, the tests that God introduced into our lives are a means of healing of our souls, the healing of our mind, the healing of our heart, the healing of our will. And may we reclaim that healing that we were given in the waters of baptism by the power and operation of the Holy Spirit. And may our lives be reoriented towards obedience and perseverance and faith. We believe, O oh Lord Jesus Christ our God, we believe that thou art the Son of God, the light of the world. We, together with the angels and the saints in heaven and the whole church on earth, worship thee, O oh most gracious Lord. In thee, together with thy Father and thy Holy Spirit, consubstantial, undivided Trinity. Amen. Christ is risen. Amen.